I didn't record the sound. I've got it fixed now, so if you do go back, if you're wondering where those first two lectures are, it would just be, you know, not much more than just looking at this. So um, I have posted the, the PowerPoint slides with the notes there, um, but I'm going to make sure the audio is actually recording from now on, so you'll, you'll have that. Okay, I have not updated really anything about the uh, syllabus or the um, assignment. I probably will later this week um, formalize the critical review sign assignment, so you can get, go ahead and get working on that when you want to. Um, I'll make an announcement uh, when I do. Um, so today, uh, last time I guess we were doing mass balances, some review there, some uh, kind of a taking a practice problem and taking a look at um, what it was like to, to deal with that and how to draw different control, control volumes for a mass balance. Um, so I, I hope to continue a little bit with review and a couple maybe extra concepts here um, talking about reactions, reactors, and kind of where they're taking place and how to take a look at the kinetics there. And again, just a moment. <clears throat> so when we're talking about reactions, um, particularly within the context of performing a reaction in some reactor uh, as part of our treatment plan of some sort, what we want to do is consider where it's happening. And typically, we could think about like a black box, okay? Something's happening in there. Something's happening in this laptop that's causing the, the screen to show stuff. But when we dig a little deeper, we can identify that if we're treating water, let's say, that reaction can be happening in different places. It could be just in the bulk phase, in the liquid um, floating around. And we would call that homogeneous or a homogeneous reaction whichever way you want to pronounce that. So that's going to be what's happening in, let's say, some container. If, if the reaction is homogeneous, that means it is the same throughout. There's no difference, you know, wherever you are in here, it doesn't matter. The reaction is all happening in every, every portion of that water that's all being reacted. So all of this is the same. So when we talk about that net rate, if we wanted to, we could uh, say that the net rate is equal to the integral of the rate in the volume in some subset of the volume. So if we were to take this water again and just take one tiny little slice of it, and call that our dv. We just add all of those up and sum, sum the rate at which it's happening in all of those and then we'll have our net reaction. Okay, so it's just a fancy way of saying exactly what I've already said. It's just happening the same throughout and the reaction in total is going to be equivalent to the reaction across uh, you know, whatever's happening throughout the whole thing. Now, this is, in some, in some way, this is important because not all, our, not all of our reactors are going to be well mixed. Maybe we have a plug flow reactor, which we'll talk about more soon, where we have a long uh, pipe sort of deal where our DV is something like that. And we're not necessarily mixing from here to the, the plug that's at, towards the end of the pipe. And so to take the net rate in that system is actually kind of important, um, whereas in a completely mixed little batch reactor here, it would, you know, we would say, well, why, why do that when you could just take the whole volume? Um, so sometimes that's important to do. Uh, and it's just an elaborate way, again, of saying, okay, the whole, the, the whole reaction, that, and the net reaction is the reaction that's occurring throughout the whole system. The other type of reaction would be what we call interfacial. So, and th this is not another type of reaction, it's another location the reaction can happen. So the, the interfacial reaction, really wanna think about 
a surface phase reaction. And I've got a couple example photos for you. Um, sometimes we make use of this on purpose. Um, I often like to think about my aquarium at home. We've, I've got uh, about a 28 gallon aquarium and a bunch of gravel at the bottom. And in fact, this gravel is designed uh, with some purpose in mind. I, I also use kind of an, a bubbling aerator thing, a couple little stacks here, just with a air stone that bu bubbles up water out to keep it aerated. And so as, as this aquarium is bubbling away, reactions in terms of reducing the fish waste from uh, urea and stuff, whatever else is in there, down to, um, you know, it, it will be converted into ammonia rather quickly. Ammonia is toxic, so we need the bacteria to be constantly converting that ammonia to nitrate. Uh, so nitrite is also toxic, so it goes ammonia, nitrite, nitrate. So we've got this uh, example here, NH3 to NO2 minus, ultimately to NO3 minus. I also have a couple plants there that help with this, but essentially, even without a plant, what's going to happen is the bacteria on the surface, uh, on the surface of the gravel and on the walls of the aquarium, all of that surface area is used specifically to do that conversion. So all the surfaces, all the interfaces in this water are really important for that to happen. And even on these aerator things, they've got surfaces. It's going to be bacteria growing on all these surfaces, providing this action, providing a spot for bacteria to attach and go do perform this attached growth type of treatment. So we use this in some wastewater treatment applications where we are we actually put in some media, sort of like the gravel here, to allow bacteria to attach and to grow and to perform this. Um, and we can make special use of this surface area phenomena where we can maybe design a material that has a particularly high surface area of providing lots of space for the bacteria to grow um, per volume. Okay, so how we would define the, this uh, interfacial uh, the net rate for the interfacial component then would be integrating o over what's happening, this reaction of some species I within, um, within the surface. So we've got this little sigma here. It's really denoting that it's a, a surface phase phenomena. And this would be that reaction term multiplied by the surface area well, excuse me, the surface area concentration, um, dV. So again, we're using the, the, the volume, um, integrating over the volume that's occupied here. But this is slightly more complicated because what we're doing here is this, A, the surface area concentration, that surface area per volume, that's giving us some indication of, okay, if we have some volume of, um, of gravel, let's say. It has some given surface area per volume. Now if I just had the tank with the four walls and no gravel, it would be a lot lower of a surface area, but we'd still have that surface area of the, the tank walls, right? So uh, depending on what we put in there, this surface area concentration term, that A, uh, can be larger or smaller, and that's going to be essentially the, the space in which the reaction is happening. So it's a lot like just taking the, the dV here just by itself for the homogeneous reaction. Um, instead, we include that component where we may have more surface area per volume in some cases than others. Okay, so for the total reaction then, really we're combining the two terms uh, if, if it's happening on in both cases. And here's a, a few more photos as, as promised here about what this would look like, how we use them. This is actually a very, this uh, surface phase reactions are very important in catalysis. So if you ever are uh, driving your car and you're, you've got a catalytic converter uh, as part of the exhaust treatment train, and it's going to be 
um, a block catalyst that looks something like this, and it's got, I think, I think they're made with a, a fair bit of platinum. Um, I mean, I say a fair bit. It's a very small amount, but there's enough that people um, do occasionally strip them out of uh, used, used or junk cars uh, for the material. And essentially, it's a this catalyst. Uh, so if platinum is the catalyst itself causing that reaction, then it's going to be supported by some structure that is robust. It can withstand the, the hot um, gases coming out of the exhaust, and it can provide the most surface area as possible. So when we think about attached growth or reactions, interfacial reactions, um, gas phase reactions are often used that way, but we also use um, water phase sometimes. So uh, all of these pieces here, you know, you'll see different shapes and sizes, different strategies to maximize surface area or provide different properties. Um, sometimes it'll be like a plastic little block here. Um, and in this lower picture we see in this wastewater treatment facility, all this uh, black looking plastic uh, chunks of stuff, that's an attached growth system where they're going to be pouring water over that or maybe filling and then draining and it's essentially going to let um, let the, the wastewater have plenty of surface area for this, the bacteria to perform their, their duties and they'll probably have some mechanism of either um, spraying it on there or filling and subsiding so that it is aerated as well. Okay, so then when we, we take a look at these re reaction terms Really what we're going to do is have a combined term. Now we'll probably keep it simple in the class so that we don't have to um, model this ourselves. Um, maybe we'll use some examples to, to get a simplified reaction term if we're going to do an interfacial reaction. Uh, we can certainly do that. Um, so I wanted to let you know what that looks like and that in, you know, in reality, even if it's you know, an empty aquarium example, we're still going to have some reaction on the surface. And if that happens much more rapidly, let's say, than in the bulk solution, then that's actually going to be quite important. Um, okay. <clears throat> so all in all, we have this um, integral, essentially, across dV. And like I was saying, that dV is really just some, however, it's useful to define some uh, portion here. And then if we define that as our control volume and then expand, integrate that across the whole system, that can be quite useful. All right, so reactions. Um, we're going to be considering essentially three reaction orders. Again, this is likely review, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Um, I'll also talk about the reactors today. I want to be clear that when I, we talk about a reaction um, and the order of a reaction that's completely independent of where we're putting it. It's an independent of whether it's surface phase, you know, interfacial or bulk, um, homogeneous. Um, and this is really talking about how the stuff is changing. What order, what reaction order means is how many times does it depend on how much stuff is in there. So a bank account that's having $100 deposited into it every month is changing on a zero order. Doesn't matter how much is in there, just putting in that much amount. If it's a, you're growing interest on it, then you've got uh, some percent, you know, maybe you're gaining 10% of what's in there every year. Um, that would, since that depends on how much is in your bank account, then that's first order. So we see that if we take a look at the math, um, a generic reaction equation can, we can talk about as that reaction of C is equal to DC DT. And this is, uh, you know, just writing that the same 
is the same thing there. So the C changing with time. Um, C here would be maybe a concentration of some something in solution. It could be growth or decay, so plus or minus a reaction rate constant K multiplied by the concentration of C to the nth power. So N being 0, 1, or 2. Here. So again, if that's 0, then our 0 order equation, this C to the 0 power goes to 1 because anything to 0 to the 0th power is 1. And so we see here that if we were to plot each of these, a, the concentration changing over time for a zero order is just going to look pretty much linear, which I did not draw a linear line there. <laughs> so this would be zeroth order. First order would be exponential. And second order, it's times c to this, um, essentially c squared. So some, some reactions we'll deal with, not many, uh, will be second order. The rate at which a radical reacts in solution depends um, to the square on how much is in there, in part because it reacts with itself so quickly, in addition to reacting with the solvent or anything else. So uh, radical chemistry, when we look at advanced oxidation processes, um, those often happen very, very quickly, and so the the way you know if we take a look at how concentrations changing over time, we end up typically having a very sharp um, increase. Something like that. So you could take you could uh, consider taking the the derivative of this. Um, this function, and you could, you know, if you were to plot, let's say, the natural log of C divided over time, that would be one way to linearize the first order, and you can uh, do a similar thing, take the um, derivative of that, and get the, a linear version of the second order reaction. So it, this is a directly analogous as well to um, physics, where we have a velocity, so change in distance over time, then acceleration, so the change in the velocity over time, and the jerk, which would be the change in acceleration over time. And so, you know, th this is exactly the same deal. Um, so you've seen this before um, in probably in several forms. Okay, and obviously each of those can be decay as well. All right, so just a, a quick note here. If we were to take a look at the zero order reaction, again, this is you know, maybe we're having some decay reaction happening like that. A couple things to note here. If we take the derivative of that, then that's just going to be a flat line because the, the rate at which it's changing over time is not changing over time. It's just changing over time. Okay, so our equation, you know, our reaction equation is essentially, in this case, negative k is all it is. So R of C equals negative k. In this example. The other thing to note here is you can actually define or um, determine the reaction order if you're given the, the units of the rate constant. So if you know something about the rate constant, you should be able to determine what the reaction order is. So in this case, I've written it here, but R of C, we should recognize from our discussion last time, basically all of our mass balances. So anytime we're looking at a mass balance, we're looking at mass per time. So in some volume, so if we do volume times dc dt, 
that's going to be mass per time, right? Because concentration is mass per volume, and with a dt of that's per time. Just multiplying that by that volume gives us, so in the, in the total volume of the whatever reaction we're doing, um, that's, going to, that's going to cause it to be mass per time here. So the units here of mass per time need to be um, sustained, need to be true throughout the, the system. So when we're looking at just the reaction, um, the reaction term here, that'd be concentration per time. And so in this case, K has to be re the concentration per time. So in this case, that's equal to negative K. So K is, um, in terms of units, must be milligrams per liter per second, right? So that's just kind of stating the obvious here, looking at the units. So the reason I'm elaborating so much is simply that maybe you, you get a problem and you see the reaction, you get the uh, reaction rate constant, but you don't know what the mass balance is supposed to look like. And so as you build that, you were thinking to yourself, oh, okay, is this a first order? Is this a second order? Is this a zero order? Use this tool here, just double checking, doing this little, little bit of units analysis, coming back to the baseline that your mass balance will be mass per time. Um, you can come down and see, okay, well, the reaction term, dc, dt, that must be concentration per time Therefore, our k must be uh, the same here in the zero order case. Now, this changes in the, the first order case. So just a, again, the quick analysis here, if we've got a decay reaction, it looks something like this. The derivative of that should be linear. And here we have c to the one power. And essentially, our um, rate constant is going to have to be in per time. And again, we see that because we have the K and the C in our DC, DT concentration per time, milligram per liter per second again. So we, then we have K times milligrams per liter meaning K is per time. In this case, one over seconds. Now, uh, you've seen this again, the bank account example is a good one because we say, oh, it's earning X percent interest. There's an implied per time there that we forget about, but it's, you know, 4% per year, or it's, you know, you could do it on some sort of monthly basis or something. But essentially, that per year is implied, and so you've actually been dealing with this as, as soon as you've learned um, about interest in um, probably Algebra 1 back in the day. Okay, so this is, again, very simple. Just want to make sure that's um, clear. You're able to do that, and so we'll go through the second order one real quick. So here we have, if it's decay, it's going to look like a pretty sharp elbow there. And its derivative will be exponential. Same deal here. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm borrowing slides from my other class for this one. We actually will do a few, um, a few second order reactions. So rather than do that, let's just edit it real quick. How about that? So we will take a look at a few. Um, it will be interesting. The, the math does get more complicated um, to integrate, as we'll see. But we will um, we will refresh our differential equations as, as ne needed and not do something that's overly complicated. OK, in this case, we have kc squared. And we need the, to get this to milligrams per liter per time. 
So essentially K has to counteract milligrams squared per liter squared to yield milligrams per liter and include a per second there. So K then should be liters per milligram per second. Okay, so now whenever you go and you're dealing with some sort of reaction, reading maybe a paper or something, and you see some sort of a rate constant given, think to yourself, oh, hey, what, what uh, reaction order is this and kind of on what basis? Is this a concentration here? Is this just a mass reacting directly? Um, what's, the, what's the rate term look like? And given a little bit of information about that, you can say, oh, hey, this is a first order reaction and it's dealing with a mass concentration here. Okay, so next thing I want to do is talk about the reactors um, where these things may be occurring. And in particular, we're talking about um, homogeneous reactions that are occurring. Um, again, we can get into heterogeneous reactions, surface phase ones, but typically if we do that, we'll really be defining the system kind of by the that surface area concentration um, and we'll have a, a very particular system for that. A lot of what we'll be doing is homogeneous and we'll have some reactors that um, may or may not have flow through them. Okay, so I've got three here and I think the book that we're using might term the second one differently. So we've got batch, that's just simply like a water bottle, has no flows coming in or out until you're ready to drain it or fill it. Um, there's a continuously stirred tank reactor, um, that's the CSDR. Our book might be calling it a CFR, continuous flow reactor. Either way, those are just analogous. Essentially what it is is a, a reactor that looks like a batch reactor, except you have flows coming in and out. Both of these are if it's an ideal case, they're going to be assumed to be completely mixed and perfectly mixed and um, just a pretty pretty simple system, no issues, uh, no dead zones or anything. In reality, we will often have in kind of maybe the corners some areas that aren't as well mixed. So you can imagine in a, if you were if you ever take a look at your coffee, if you pour creamer in and see the mixing happening in re real time, it's a pretty small container and mixed around with a spoon, it gets pretty well mixed pretty quickly. If you try that in the swimming pool, you can imagine it's going to take a while for it to actually mix through the whole system. So it's going to take a lot stronger, a lot bigger of an impeller and in some corners, nooks and crannies in the reactor, you can imagine it might not be uh, perfectly mixed almost ever. So it kind of depends on the scale a little bit. In a laboratory it's pretty easy to get a, a pretty uh, fairly close to an ideal reactor um, but at larger scales there's there's more difficulties as you scale. Last one is called a plug flow reactor um, and I guess I should well I'll, I'll go into more detail on each of these in a moment but essentially we consider this one as individual plugs of water flowing through the reactor and we define again that that DV concept where we have just that slice that, that one slice of the volume and we're integrating um, across the whole volume of these slices okay and I'll, I'll explain more in just a moment when we consider the mass balance, so, so the reason we want to consider these different react reactor types is to understand how to build a mass balance, okay? And in doing so, we need to understand how the reactions are functioning within these. I mean, they're all, reactions are not going to be anything different, but the, um, the setup will change the mass balance as it relates to the reactions. So an example here is the batch reactor. We have no flow going in and out, so when we write up our mass balance, the accumulation is essentially going to be, if we have accumulation, that means there's a reaction happening. Um, 
and maybe there's a reaction growth and a reaction decay and so then we have accumulation to zero we've got a steady state of the same amount of growth as decay that can happen um, so but typically this uh, accumulation rate is going to be equal to the reaction rate so only so we'll say only at steady state so a steady state is when we our accumulation is zero when the net reaction term is zero okay so in a continuous flow reactor we can have a, a steady state where we have nothing accumulating in the system even though we have some reaction happening because maybe we're adding in lots of wastewater we're removing it with a reaction at, at a steady rate and our discharge is removing some of it as well so we don't accumulate more waste in this box um, even though we're constantly putting um, putting waste in so the batch reactor is very simple and this is actually the easiest way to learn about our reaction kinetics because we have no flows to deal with we can directly measure how the rate is affecting the, the reaction rate is affecting the concentration of something in there okay so overall the assumptions are no inputs no outputs uh, perfect mixing and this you know that means that our accumulation rate is equal to the reaction rate all right so this CSTR or the CFR essentially is this well mixed system except we have an inflow and an outflow this means that our accumulation rate is going to include the input in the output rate as well as the reaction so in practice this is often going to mean that our accumulation term is going to be related to some flow rate in times the initial concentration minus the flow rate out times the final concentration plus this reaction net reaction term on the other side so um, when we solve this equation it's going to look a fair bit different than when we solve the equation over here where this is accumulation simply equals the reaction what this might look like is V DC DT is equal to negative K C let's say to the one power something like that right whereas in this is also in some volume so we have V DC DT equals negative K C V V's will cancel and then we're left with this um, differential here DC DT equals negative K C then we can integrate that to get a term that's uh, where we can solve for C or solve for K or something like that right so depending on what we need with the system we can solve that equation from there and this this time our DC DT might be zero if we have steady state um, which would simplify things we don't have to do any differential equations there um, but essentially it's going to be equal to something like QC naught minus QC plus um, V K C maybe minus V um, if we do a K for growth and a K for decay um, C there so that's if we have a first first order growth and a first order decay um that would be the the setup there right maybe we have no decay and that term goes to zero or something um, but essentially this is what it looks like then if we have to 
if it's not steady state, if we're trying to figure out what's happening before we reach a steady state, um, then we need to end up sol integrating and solving. Um, if we are at steady state, this turn comes to zero, and then it's simpler to rearrange algebraically and um, solve for whatever term we're looking for. Okay, so see a lot of these. Um, fair amount will be uh, steady state, but it's, it's certainly possible to integrate, um, to simplify on the basis of C um, pretty often, especially if we had a zero order, there's going to be no Cs over there, a lot of constants. Um, that also simplifies things. And you can, uh, you can think about that too in your, in your mind. You, know, you don't think to yourself, oh, I need some differential equation to solve this problem if you're thinking about, okay, I'm taking X amount of water out of the swimming pool every day, how much do I need to add? <laughs> you know, uh, if I'm adding, if I'm putting the hose in once a week and I'm taking this amount out uh, you know, every day, even if there's some small complexities, like it, you're thinking to yourself, oh, I can just do that in my head um, on that scale. So these systems can become um, very intuitive and very straightforward, um, even if there's the elaborate um, way to solve it as well. Okay, so plug flow reactors are an interesting case. There's a couple ways to derive the mass balance for for these, and we'll. I think next time we'll get into uh, we'll get into it a little bit more in terms of how to uh, how to derive the mass balance equation here. Um, I'll, I'll introduce it today. Um, essentially, what we're doing is we again have this continuous input and continuous output, so we can imagine it like a long pipe, um, and oftentimes we'll build these things as kind of a, a snake-like structure or let's say we have an input here at the top output there at the bottom and then baffles all the way through so that as water flows in and through it has to essentially work its way all the way through and I didn't do this. So then the water has to work its way all the way through to get to the end. And so essentially what's happening here is we're intentionally making sure that it's not well mixed throughout the whole system. The reason we, we would do that is because if we have a reaction that depends on the amount of concentration we have in there, then um, sometimes it's beneficial to have um, to not have it all mixed all in together. So if we have a reaction, you know, in the, in the previous case, as soon as we put water, this inflow into here, and it's well mixed, we went from C naught, our initial concentration, to whatever is in here is the stuff that's going out. So immediately that that we have a concentration change. It's like it's like this coming in through the pipe, and then boom, now it's here. Um, if we're decaying something inside, so that's it's nice in a sense because you have that instant jump downwards in the concentration. Um, in reality, the concent the uh, the stuff in the system is just being de decreased over time. I mean, it's uh, constantly uh, being decreased. But in effect, if it's perfectly mixed, that concentration jumps um, as soon as it enters because it's diluted. Now, that's kind of nice in a way, but that means that the reaction is taking place on the basis of C, which is lower than C0. So if we're removing a percentage of C over time, then we would rather, we, we could remove more if we were taking C naught as our, um, you know, if this is a higher concentration here, it would be better to be removing from that than to be removing from C. So in essence, the plug flow reactor allows us to keep that C naught that's entering here, and because we're not mixing with the C final that's leaving, 
then we are essentially making more efficient use of that first order reaction. So in a zero order reaction, this probably doesn't make any sense. Uh, probably be, might as well do the other. So as it's going, essentially what's happening is we treat this little slice, this little plug, as a batch reactor that's well mixed within itself, but not well mixed side to side with the other plugs. So there's a couple ways to look at it. One is that we have a little cup or a little batch reactor on a conveyor belt, and it has a reaction happening, and it's conveyed through the pipe, and then it pours its contents out the end. And so in that way, we can act, we can um, treat it as if it's a batch reactor and model the, the kinetics of what happens as if it's just a very simple batch reactor and we just keep it in the batch for X amount of time and that amount of time is equal to the amount of time water spends in the system before it gets um, dumped out the other end. The other way we can look at it is actually um, an infinite number of continuously stirred reactors that are in series. So one little reaction flows into the next little reaction, flows into the next one, and the math will actually end up working out, um, as we'll see when we take a look at the um, deriving uh, the expressions for these. So I'm going to say, or like an infinite number of CSTRs in series. And these are going to be infinitely small as well. They're going to be very, that DV concept that I was talking about earlier, um, integrating over all of that, um, we would need that concept. So, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll get there. We'll talk a little more about that once we're actually um, elaborating on these mass balances within these systems. Okay, so that brings us to uh, the last important component of understanding the hydraulic, uh, the, uh, the system here, and that's the hydraulic retention time, or tau. You might see me refer to this also as theta, which is a common way to describe it. Um, that's, our book tends to use tau, so I'm going to try to keep with that. Um, but just to, just to warn you, I might accidentally slip in a theta there um, from um, teaching my other class, we use theta. Okay, so tau then, this is how long the water is retained in, the, in a reactor. This is just gonna be simply V over Q, so the volume of the reactor divided by the flow rate through the reactor very simple units analysis here. If you were to forget um, which arrangement is it's in, this is a time, right? So the hydraulic retention time, um, V divided by Q, that's going to be a volume divided by a volume per time. Time comes up to top um, in terms of the units. And so that's, that's going to be quite useful and it's going to be really important to understand how much time a given um, a given set of water as in the plug flow case has in the reactor. Uh, we can also look at it in terms of on average how much time is water spending as it enters this continuous flow reactor is mixed around you know some water will probably go in and get moved directly out um, but some of it will last a lot longer what's the average amount of time it spends in there is the question. And that, that's our hydraulic residence time. Okay, so there's a, a nice little tracer test video. Oops. I need to do that over here. Pull it up, maybe. Okay, so we have this little system where we've got dye flowing into or being added kind of at 
at the start over there. Um, sort of, I think they're making it so that it's adding a, sort of at a flat um, sheet in some way. And we see it just flowing around this corner and we can see in this case we have a little patch here that looks like it's not getting very well mixed. Um, and I'll just use the mouse here. So we've got this little, the corner here, it's not particularly well mixed. Also at this far edge here, it's looking like it's not getting the same amount of dye as other places. Um, yeah, even the input here is not perhaps perfectly mixed across the system. Um, but the idea again here is you have this, um, this plug that is uh, ideally perfectly mixed within that plug. And we see here that some issues with a reactor where it's not entirely ideal, um, especially on the out, outlet side here. We can see some, uh, some of that process of dispersion where we've got this cent central area traveling faster, um, carrying dye further. So if we're detecting over here, let me, um, let me play that. Okay, we're going to talk more about tracer tests next time, but let me just point out something right, right here real quick. Um, when we do a tracer test, it's a lot, I mean, this is a tracer test. You add dye to the, the front and it looks like they're doing continuous input. You could also do like a pulse. You just drop a bunch in and let it go. Essentially what you're going to do is you're going to be measuring at the output, maybe at the end of the reactor, you're going to have some measurement how much dye is in this water. Um, so you, what you would do is you'd collect across this whole sheet and average that concentration. So you're going to be doing this over time. As soon as this front, um, front end of the dye hits, that would be our first collection point where it's like, oh, now we have some dye coming out. And what this lets us do is have an empirical measurement of the hydraulic retention time. So we add the, we're, we have it continuously flowing, steady flow, and we want to know how much time the water spends in here. And what we're going to end up with is what we call a residence time distribution, where some of the water resides in the reactor longer than other, other parts of the water. And so that first bit that comes out, that will be our first set, or our first time point where we're like, oh, some of the water exits after 30 seconds. Um, some of the rest of the water comes out after two minutes or something. Now, um, what you'll end up seeing is if you were to take this concentration and graph the concentration over time, you'll see an increasing amount of concentration. And if you've got this continuous input, then you'll eventually reach that the input amount. Like whatever concentration you're inputting, you'll eventually see that in your concentration profile. If you were to just do a pulse, then you would see at some point you've got that, the spike, the peak, and then it'll start tapering back off. So you understand, okay, are there some zones where um, maybe in this little corner here, what the dye ends up getting kind of stuck and takes a long time for it to wash back out. Um, you can learn a lot about the reactor, a lot about um, the system in practice uh, rather than just assuming it's a, an ideal reactor uh, by doing these tracer tests. Okay. Okay, so when we want to do a mass balance, um, and I'll just do a kind of a quick example here for these. Um, hopefully Hopefully, again, this is either review or um, you've seen something like it before. But I just want to make sure that uh, we're on the same we're on the same page here. So, if we want to derive a mass balance for a concentration, so we want to get a, a an equation given the assumption this mass balance assumption that we're, we have conservation of mass. Um, Accumulation rate is equal to input minus output plus reaction. We'll do a batch reactor case here. So in this case, on the left, we're going to take a zero order decay example. 
So with the batch reactor, we have no inputs and no outputs. So our in sum volume, our DC DT, is going to be equal to V times, and this is decay, so it'll be negative K times C to the zero power is one. Okay, so the volumes cancel. Our DC DT equals negative K. All right, quite simple. And so when we differentiate this, we'll say DC equals negative K DT. Go ahead and integrate both sides. C minus C naught is equal to essentially negative K T. Because what we're going to do is we're going to in integrate from zero to time T and from C naught to C. So from here we can say if we're solving for C, we could just simply say C equals negative K T plus C naught. Okay, so it should be um, quite simple and easy there. And again, the batch, batch cases are a very nice way to look at um, specifically the reaction term uh, because there's no input or output. Okay, we can do the same thing for the first order, and this is, we're gonna have to um, remember just a, a little bit of calculus here, um, but again, this is gonna be very straightforward and you'll remember it as soon as I say it. So here again, we have V dc dt equals, and this time it's V times negative K C to the one power, V's will cancel, then we're left with dc dt is equal to um, negative kc. We'll integrate this by parts. So we do dc over c equals negative k um, dt. Again, integrate. And here's where I'm going to remind you that the integral of 1 over x is the natural log of x. Right. So that's the, that's the thing to remember. Um, in order to be able to derive these first order um, equations. So here we'll have natural log of C minus the natural log of C naught equals negative K T. The natural log of X minus the natural log of Y is the same thing as saying the natural log of X divided by Y. So we can say this is natural log of C divided by C naught equals negative KT. We can rearrange this and say take E to the power of both sides. That gives us C over C naught equals E to the minus KT. Starting to look very familiar. And we could, if we want it in C, then we could get C equals C naught times E to the minus KT. Now we've just de derived the interest rate equation that you learned back in algebra a long time ago, um, P, the PERT equation or whatever. Okay, so that's, um, again, I hope this is in a way review and a good reminder of how we come about from the, the principle of like the reaction order to what's happening in our mass balance here. Okay, and these are just decay examples. You could certainly do the growth. That'll change things slightly. In the case of the continuous flow reactors, um, there would be some change there as well. I'm not doing second order here. We'll spend a little more time on that when we need to. Um, but essentially, it's the same exact process. We just need to um, dig up the uh, calculus to do it properly there. And I haven't done it for, for us today. So um, when we encounter that, and it's um, will be interesting to cover. We'll, we'll go back through it and make sure that we have, have the calculus tools in place to, uh, um, to integrate properly. Um, now, I'll note that when we, when we do have the, react, the uh, inputs and outputs, it can complicate um, separating the Cs and, and doing the integration that way, which is why um, steady state systems are so nice, because sometimes the if you don't have a steady state system, 
uh, you get to a point where you, you have to do the um, integration numerically instead of um, directly like this. Okay. And my note here is this is the same process for the plug flow reactors, but you would, instead of using some time, some reaction time that you're letting it sit in the bottle or the bucket, you, um, that's, you use tau, the amount of time the water is spent spending inside the reactor. Okay, then for the uh, continuous flow case, here we do have inputs and outputs. We have this reaction term dc dt equals negative k c naught, or, or excuse me, c to the zero power for the zeroth order decay, and of course first to the first power for the uh, first order decay. Okay, so in this case, uh, and I mentioned this before, we will have dc dt in some volume equals here we would have q c naught minus q c in this case we have decay so minus v k and times one for c to the zero now we'll go ahead and assume steady state here um, so it'll make the process a little simpler we don't have to make this assumption um, so in some cases we can't but I'm going to go ahead and do it as part of this example here it'll be more often than not we will do this um, but keep in mind that you'll have that DCDT term remaining here if it's not at steady state, uh, which makes sense because we have some change in concentration in our control volume over time if we're not at steady state. Okay, so in this case we have QC naught minus QC minus VK. And again, we're gonna go ahead and solve for C, and we don't always have to solve for C, maybe we're solving for V. Um, or Q or something. So given that we're going to solve for C, I think it's going to be convenient to divide everything by Q. Go ahead and get C by itself. So I'm going to say 0 equals C naught minus C minus V over Q here. That's the same thing as writing the tau because that's our hydraulic resonance time term. And then we can get C by itself. We'll say C equals C naught minus, I'm going to, go, going to go ahead and put the tau in here, times k. And then that would be our term. So in each of these, again, what I'm, what I'm doing is solving for c as an example, but the generalized mass balance would be uh, essentially up here, and then it's a matter of solving from there to get what we need. Um, I, I want to be clear about this because I remember when I was taking grad classes, I had a few professors that would say, you know, solve the mass balance. And it was always unclear, okay, uh, solve, what, what do you mean solve? <laughs> um, specifically, find what you, you know, what are you looking for and arrange the mass balance. Because the mass balance is just going to be a platform to work from. And manipulate that until you can get that in, in the form that you need to answer the question. Um, is essentially what, what we mean when we say solve the mass balance, right? So in this case, I'm assuming that we're interested in C in particular. Sometimes you'll be interested in C divided by C naught. Um, you know, what's the ratio of what, you're, what you ended up with compared to what you started with? And, and that would give you the percent and, you know, or a, you could multiply that by 100, get the percent of what, what's remaining or something like that. So really, it's going to be used for whatever you need it for, and that'll kind of direct how you solve it. Okay, the first order case, same deal here, V dc dt is equal to Q uh, C naught minus Q C minus V K 
and this time we have c to the 1 power. Again, we're going to go ahead with the steady state assumption. Then we have q c naught, or excuse me, q, I did that backwards a moment ago. Q's, no, no, that's fine. q c naught minus q c minus v k c. Okay, this time we have two c terms, um, so that's complicating it just slightly. We can still divide everything by q, uh, which will be helpful. So we'll go ahead and do that. 0 equals c naught minus c minus tau k c. Now here we could, um, we want c, so let's um, go ahead and separate the terms a little bit, and we'll say c plus tau kc equals c naught. So I just added added those to both sides, and then I can separate. I'll take c out of both terms and say c times one plus tau k equals c naught. So I just uh, factored that out, factored a C out. And then that basically gives me it from here, divide both sides by 1 plus tau k. So then our term for a continuously stirred tank reactor, for C, if it's a first order decay reaction, C is equal to C naught divided by 1 plus tau k. So relatively simple um, in terms of the final result. So you should be able to derive these, um, as particularly for the, um, the steady state cases. So I wanted to just run through a few examples with you rather quickly. Um, you should be able to do it if this is growth instead of decay. And you should be able to have some idea of, well, what happens if we you know, and this could be something you practice on your own, what would happen if we had a first order growth and a zero order decay in the system? You know, what you would do is just simply take this reaction term, and in that case it would be, you know, what did I say, a zero order, a first order growth, VK, so it would be plus VKC, and then a zero order decay, that would be minus V k and c to the zero power is one that would be the terms at the end of the equation instead of just just the one or the other decay terms this would be true of the batch case too you should be able to derive some equation if you had two things happening at once um, you know and again to, to think about a bank account you could be depositing money but also paying interest at the same time and two two effects on your your balance and how is that affecting your accumulation, right? Uh, there's different ways you could look at a bank account. The analogy is not perfect, but um, hopefully helpful to understand how how these the reaction term is affecting it. Okay. Any issues or questions or comments or anything? So one last thing I wanted to talk about today is how to find K uh, if you're given some data. Um, in some cases, maybe you're doing a, an experiment in the lab and you're wondering, okay, what are the kinetics here? How quickly are things happening? Um, and maybe you want to know something about the reaction that's occurring and all you can see is the observations that you're making. Um, how do you go from there? So given some empirical data, maybe you have collected data and it looks something like this. And you're wondering to yourself, well, I, I think it, it looks a little bit exponential here. And maybe I can do a line of best fit or a, an exponential of best fit. Um, 
but you know you're just you're not quite sure and you're you're trying to figure out uh, what's happening here so first of all you want to use a batch case um, if at all possible that's going to simplify uh, everything from your observations to um, just processing you do, you have fewer moving parts you have fewer things that complicates and could be introducing error so using a, a simple batch, batch case is ideal um, this uh, the concept of a half-life you know you've heard of half-life before you the half-life of some element that's radioactive or whatever um, this is actually the same concept if you tell me the half-life of something then I will know the kinetics because I can calculate them from um, from from this data so if we go back up to our batch case here um, this final these final concentrations here or equations for the concentrations will actually be one way we can find K so instead of solving for C here if we solve them for K and we're doing this in a batch case then we can know K um, now the trick will be to get a, a plot of the data that allows us to find the slope appropriately um, the simplest simplest way to do that is to linearize the data so in this case if we were to take um, the natural log of C over C naught like we saw in our um, our batch equation right the um, we saw that C equals C naught e to the minus kt for the decay first order decay this looks like a first order decay to me what I drew and so that's what I would take is instead of doing that let, let's do this let's take a different color here and say okay when we when we cross this out and put in I'm just gonna write this again make it a little more clear then when we plot it on the new axis it should be essentially linear because these data points will end up um, appearing in, in a linear fashion on the natural log plot and if we plot it as C over C naught we can see that's going to be you know C divided by C naught is equal to E to the minus KT when we take the natural log of that that's directly minus KT this is Y equals MX okay so you've done Y equals MX plus B that's how we're finding the slope here this this M is the K so if we take this uh, take some data linearize it if we need um, which I just kind of showed you here I'll, I'll put some data in an Excel sheet and do that live with you as well in a moment and then we can plot the data find that slope of best you know the line of best fit and get the slope from that and that slope is going to port directly to our K if we've done it if we've done it right we can do this for zero order equations first order equations second order equations we just have to get the linearization correct and then we'll have that slope okay um, this is just a repeat because I was going to do it zero and first order but I kind of did it on the same page okay so here's an example from not our book some other book um, data for HOCL disinfection of polio virus at a concentration of 1.8 milligrams per liter of the chlorine so HOCLs are um, hydrochloric acid uh, as shown below adapted from uh, study from 1979 temperature was 20 degrees C the pH was 6 um, and it's saying determine the rate constant for inactivation assuming uh, this chick Watson model applies we'll talk about that later um, essentially it's uh, we're just going to take a look at this data and find the, the the rate constant all right so let's see if I can do this for you Oh, 
you want. I wanted go away. There we go. Okay. So let's type this up real fast. We're just gonna do time in seconds and just the platform platforming units. Uh, that's the way we count the viruses. Zero, two, four, six, eight. And here we had 6,152 as our starting concentration, 3,000 as our next one, 1,200, 710, and 300. And one thing to note is this here is our C naught, the uh, 6,000, so that's our initial amount. And really any of these lower than that, we can consider C at time you know, two, C at time four, and whatnot. Okay, so in this case, um, we've got our data, and we, let's do this. We wanna then make a plot. And it selected everything for us, great. Okay, so that's, that's what it would look like, just plotting the data straight up. Okay, that's nice, but not very linear. If we were to do a line of best fit, I imagine it wouldn't look very great. Um, my picture's in the way. Okay, so if we did a linear and we put the um, equation and the R squared value, we'll see that's not a very great fit. Um, R squared 0.85 or something. Okay, so not great, and we probably would be better to fit it with a, an exponential curve. Um, so instead, what we're going to do is take the natural log of C over C naught. And here we can do, what I'm going to do is take C as our current time, our concentration currently, so I'm just going to take that one, divide that by, um, you know, I'm going to add natural log in here. So we need natural log of the current concentration divided by the initial. And so when I do the initial, there's a cool thing you can hit F4, and it adds the, um, the number signs for you. Um, and if you, you can cycle through which ones. I just learned this like a month ago and then had to look it up again a, a day or two ago. So... I always like sharing Excel knowledge because it's, it's just so nice to know. So pressing F4, not Alt F4, that's a different thing. <laughs> um, so that'll freeze the, the pane so it's not going to shift sideways or anything, um, or down when I fill it down. So that'll keep the C not at um, this uh, D, uh, C4 so right at the 6,152 here. Okay. So that's just giving us our C over C naught, and then I can fill that downwards. The natural log of one is zero, so because anything to the zero power is one. Um, so that, that makes sense. That sh first value should be zero. And then these ones, um, since it's a decay term, we have decreasing amounts. Uh, the natural log values, it is normal to see them as negative here. So given that, what I want to do is now, let's see if I just plot these two, and I'm not sure, maybe it'll do it automatically for me again. This time we have a plot that is quite linear. And if we take this, add the trend line here, this one linear, and go ahead and display the equation and that. And here, this time, we have r squared of 0.995. Okay, so much better. And that's, that's the process there of linearizing it and solving for that, um, that slope there. And in this case, I would probably force it through the intercept at 0 because we defined this natural log c over c naught system. We expect the, the 0 value to actually be 0 without any offset. So I, I would probably include that, and it would you know, tweak things just a tad. But that would be the, the way to derive empirically um, a solution to this uh, question here. Now, this question had a little bit more with um, 
more happening with chlorine, and we'll get there with the, the temperature, the pH, those will affect the equilibrium constant, so that some portion of the chlorine is going to be in HOCl, but it's also in equilibrium with OCl minus and H plus. And so the temperature and pH affect this. Give the pH is most important, and that um, at pH 6, most of it will be in HOCl. Um, but yeah, so that's, there'd be some, some added flavor to this problem itself, but we'll, we'll talk more about that later. I just wanted to show you um, how you would find, how you, linear, how you could linearize and find um, this data. Same type of deal, if you were to tell me that you had a half-life of five days, I would say, oh, okay. Um, so we'll say a half-life example here. So for half-life, you know, if, you know, and you probably have seen this written as tau one-half or something like that. Um, if this is equal to, let's say, three days, then what I know is C over C naught equals one-half at T equals three days, right? So this gives you... Um, everything you need and when we're using half-lives we're usually talking about like a first order decay the amount of radioactive material decaying depends on how much material you have there so um, if you're given a problem that says the amount was halved in this amount of time that's a per time it, it should cue you in that that per time is unit is sort of built in there kind of like the interest per year or whatever so what this gives us then is c over c naught is known equals e to the minus k and t is known, right? So we could translate this and say the natural log of 1 over 2, that 1 half, is equal to negative k times 3 days. So then we can solve for k. All right, so again, probably stuff that you've done before, probably quite often. Just wanted to be clear um, and give you nice, hopefully, um, good examples here of how to, how to do this on your own. All right, so that's all I have for you today. And next time we'll, we'll take a look at um, reactors in series and come back to that plug flow reactor and how, how that relates to the... Um, batch reactor and go from there.